afternoon. I am here to talk to you today about WebAuthn, Passkeys, and you, the future of authentication. Who am I? My name is William Brown. I'm a senior software engineer at SUSE Labs. Uh, I primarily work on identity management systems and LDAP. I am based in Brisbane, Australia, which means that for our international viewers, I'm often not online. So the best way to get in contact with me is via email, uh, which is william.brown at suza.com. So you may have heard about passkeys. Now, uh, they were announced last year by Apple, um, and they've been promised as a replacement for passwords. They're faster to sign win, in with and better. And normally when we have announcements like this in tech circles, they tend to stay within technology circles. They don't tend to escape from those areas. However, we've even seen in Australia that our mainstream media with the ABC News have actually published their own articles about passkeys and how tech giants want to kill off and remove passwords. So the question becomes, what are passkeys? And this is where things start to get a little bit confusing and difficult for us, is that there is no clear definition of what a passkey is. Because of there being no real definition, it, it started with the fact that Apple announced passkeys but didn't say what they were. It's really started to appear like a marketing term or just a friendly way to describe you know, web or thin credentials and authenticators. And over time, this uh, definition has evolved and has actually created multiple different meanings or understandings of what a passkey is. So our first definition of what is a passkey is all possible WebAuthn authenticators. So this could be things like your YubiKey or Touch ID on your Mac or your fingerprint sensor on your phone or your Android phone. But to give you a demonstration of what it looks like to use a passkey to authenticate to a web service or a website, let's have a look at a demo. So here I have a website which accepts passkeys. And I'm a new user, so I'm going to register myself. And I'm going to register as everything open 2023. And today, I can spell correctly, which is lovely. I'm going to begin my registration, and I am prompted to create a passkey for the website. My YubiKey is blinking, and I'm now going to touch it, and I'm prompted to enter my PIN. I enter that PIN, I touch the key again, and I've now registered this YubiKey with this website. If I want to authenticate, once again, click Authenticate. My key is blinking, so I touch it. I type in my PIN, touch it again, and I've now authenticated. Now, if I was to take this YubiKey and throw it to one of the many people in our audience right now, they would not be able to use that key because they don't have my PIN, only I know it. So it's not just possession, it's also that PIN is unique to me. Now, let's try out how this looks in a different way with a different device. So we've gone over to Safari, and I'm going to uh, register a new user, which is the AV team is the best, thank you. Now, uh, I will now begin my registration in Safari, and I get a slightly different prompt this time. This time, I'm prompted to save a passkey, and I'm prompted for my fingerprint. Now, I'm using a MacBook Pro, so I'm going to touch the fingerprint reader. It's going to register that fingerprint, and I've now registered this credential. Now, let's say that I've gone out, and I've decided to go see my friend at Honest Rob and his car Explodium, and I left my laptop at home, and so I'm using one of his totally legitimate laptops. So I want to authenticate. So what I have here with me is I've got my phone, which is also signed in with my Apple ID. I'm going to select to authenticate, and I'm going to pick other options. And I'm going to select to use my iPhone, iPad, or Android device, which says use it from a device with a camera. Select continue. I'm going to open up the camera app on my phone scan that QR code, and right now I'm getting a sign-in prompt on my phone, and in a moment I'll be asked for touching that, and I which, which I'll touch now. And once that touch is complete, the authentication is now completed on the laptop, which is really quite cool that I can use my phone to authenticate in that way. So, what did we just see? How did that work? What just came together to allow me to use these devices and authenticate in that way? There are three parts in a WebAuthn uh, 
operation. You have the relying party, which is the web server or website, which is hosting that service. You have the client, which is, in this case, it doesn't mean Google. The client actually means your web browser. That could be Chrome, Safari, or something else that has the capability of interacting with these devices. And then you have the authenticator. And this is the hardware secure element or cryptographic authenticator, which you have in your possession and you can interact with. And these come together and there is a whole series of interactions which we aren't going to get into the complete nitty gritty of today and all the exact details of how this works. But the general overview is that within your web browser, you initiate an authentication to the website which sends you back a challenge. The challenge is then processed by the client and then sent into the authenticator. The authenticator then creates a signature and that signature is then sent back to your client, uh, your web browser, where it is then passed back to the relying party who validates that the authenticator was legitimate. So at its core, what we're talking about here is WebAuthn being a form of public-private key cryptography or asymmetric key cryptography. And this is similar to past attempts at cryptographic authentication with things like PIV or um, smart cards. Now, what happens is that we have a private key stored in our authenticator and we have some data that we wish to sign. That private key can sign that data and create a signature. And that signature can be sent to our relying party which has the public key. It can then validate that public key and uh, validate that signature, sorry, uh, and, assure, and is assured that only that private key could have created that signature. However, knowing just the public key and given that data, you cannot falsify or fake that signature. This is really good because it means that if the relying party is compromised or exploited, then the, uh, unlike a password which has to be stored either in plain text, which is unfortunately all too common, or a hash, which can then be exploited in various ways, Knowledge of the public key and its exploit or publication does not weaken the security of you, the user. It doesn't have personal identifying information and someone can't go and then start impersonating you. So this is really good because it means that private key really is yours. It really means you are who you say you are and you are, have a much stronger level of authentication and security as the user. So the next question that I'm kind of preempting about pass keys and WebAuthn here is, are they multi-factor? Because as security professionals and technology professionals, we've been recommending people to move to multi-factor authentication for a long time. And multi-factor authentication until this point has looked like a password combined with something like a TOTP, or it has been a password combined with our security keys once again. And these boil down to something we know and something that we have. So how are we now taking this device, which was previously a single factor, and turning it into both something that we know and have? We are now making it the sole multi-factor authenticator. And how this works comes from that element of the demo which I showed you where that pin was requested. The browser um, actually contacts the device over USB and in that request actually sends the pin that you typed in into the authenticator. The authenticator validates that pin is correct, and if that pin is not correct, it will not proceed. Only if that pin is correct will it proceed. And then it waits for interaction. So I have to physically touch the device. If this was malware or someone was remotely controlling my computer, they can't fake that interaction on my machine. I have to be physically at the device and have been the one who put in that pin. This interaction and pin verification are all embedded into the signed result, and that signature is then released. So we now have a cryptographic proof that I have not only touched the device, but I have also am the one who interacted with it. So this is how we get a very strong assurance with WebAuthn and passkeys that it is not just someone in possession of this device, but it is me or the owner of that device who is in possession. This, this is very similar with Touch ID on machines that have it or your phone is that when the request is sent into the device, the fingerprint is requested on the device, and you, when you put your fingerprint on the reader, 
the act of putting your finger on the reader is not only the interaction that is required to prevent malware, um, but it is also validating the biometrics of your fingerprint at that point. Depending on the type of hardware, I know that with Apple devices, the fingerprint reader isn't actually connected to your operating system, it's actually connected into the secure enclave. So the fingerprint can't be falsified by the operating system or even captured, and that fingerprint data never leaves the device. These, again, these um, data are embedded in the user verification uh, elements and that signature is released. So in that demo, I did what looked a little bit like a magic trick where the phone authenticated me. And I think that this is one of the more interesting parts of web authentic is that until this point, we've, we've generally thought about things like YubiKeys or security keys as being a single device, and the keys are stored within that device. And, you know, not all devices can work with, with WebAuthn, and there's a lot of things that have um, improved with FIDO to make these single device credentials be able to support pins and other things. But with my phone, I, um, uh, what Apple has done and what other providers will do, such as Google or Microsoft, is they are creating what is called a multi-device credential. And that is where the private keys are synchronized between your devices. So in my demo, when I enrolled that device, the private key that was generated for this website that was on my Mac was then encrypted, put into the iCloud keychain, and then only other devices in my account can download, decrypt that private key, and then use it. And that is how then my phone also had access to that private key to then perform that authentication. So when I scan that QR code, what has occurred is that uh, the QR code has prompted uh, a Bluetooth low energy connection to my phone, which has then allowed my phone to complete the rest of the authentication and send the necessary data and signatures back to the browser. So because of this multi-device credential nature that we've now started to see from vendors, which is very useful for many people, is the second definition of what is a passkey. And this is that passkeys are a synchronized credential. So this definition became uh, popular soon after the Apple announcement of what passkeys were, and this is still used by many services today. There are many websites and services which still refer to passkeys as these synchronized credentials as opposed to these single device credentials like your YubiKey. So we've got these great credentials. They are cryptographic. They're very secure. They can be synchronized. They might be stored. They're generally stored in a secure enclave. The next question is, can they be phished? And this is really important because phishing is one of those attacks that's very endemic and it has been the cause of many high-profile breaches that you are likely aware of. And we need to, you know, if we are going to improve authentication, we need to get past phishing. This is a, a, a huge problem. Today, things like passwords and TOTP can still be phished in real time and then replayed immediately to the target website. So to understand phishing resistance in WebAuthn, we need to come back to our workflow and understand the interactions that are occurring here. In fact, the step that matters to prevent phishing within WebAuthn and passkeys is at this stage here between the collected client data from the browser and how it is sent into the authenticator. The data that is sent into the authenticator is actually taken from two sources. The first source of data is this credential request options. This includes the relying party identifier, which is a part of the DNS or the domain name of the website that you are visiting. So this is what the relying party is telling you that its domain name is. But the second part is the origin. And this origin is actually not collected from the relying party, it's collected from our web browser. So this means that we have now, in our collected client data, a true and realistic view of what the user is seeing. So it doesn't matter if it's a, uh, a homonym, attack or similar, just because it can trick a person, we are embedding the exact set of bytes of that domain name into this collected client data that will be signed. So these data are then uh, hashed and then sent into the authenticator, which will sign these as part of its verification data, and then these are sent back to the relying party for validation. So 
To put this in uh, a, a theoretical attack scenario, let's say that I go to totally legit legitimate uh, Rob's Honest Cars website .com, which is trying to fish me for my corporate account. And I've fallen for the email, which happens to any of us, we are all human. And I've gone to this domain and I haven't noticed that it's totallydodgy.com. As I've performed this signature, the signature and the origin that's in this collected client data says totallydodgy.com, and I've signed that. And that's fine, because if the website that's trying to fish me forwards this signature to the legitimate corporate site, it will check that signature and say, yes, this really is Williams Authenticator, but that domain name is wrong. So I'm going to refuse to allow this authentication to proceed because this is clearly a phishing attack. And that can actually be signaled and uh, used to determine if, if there are further indicators of compromise that you need to follow up. And this is so important to, to really stress this, that WebAuthenty is not able to be phished because of these properties. The relying party ID must be part of the effective domain or the origin of the website that you're accessing. The origin comes from the browser, not the relying party, which means that it's much harder to actually tamper with. Uh, the signature contains both the origin and the relying party ID, so we have a cryptographic assurance on the, uh, of what the user is actually seeing and accessing. And you know, where this comes back to that phishing thing is that those synced credentials still do rely on the security of the identity provider that backs them. So the security of a YubiKey is about physical possession, the security of your Apple credentials is about the security of your Apple ID account password and second factor. Apple do require 2FA for those credentials. Other providers may or may not. We don't know. So this is great. We've got these unfishable credentials. They're very secure. There's cryptographic auth. It's, it's very easy to use. I want to start enrolling it. Well, what if I run out of keys? How many sites can this work with? So. We want to empower our users to be able to use these keys without, to, with reckless abandon. And the answer is, you can use this on an infinite number of sites. But there is an asterisk here. The asterisk is a pretty big one. The way that we allow these credentials to work with an infinite number of sites happens at this stage, when we first have our browser initiate the authentication from our relying party. And so what happens at this stage to allow this infinite set of credentials is that when we go to the browser, when, when our client says, hey, I want to log in as William, the relying party says, okay, cool. Here's the list of credential IDs that William has ever logged in with. And these credential IDs are this base64 blob. And these base64 blobs are actually an encrypted blob. And these encrypted blobs are encrypted with the internal primary key of your device. And they are encrypted with AES. And if your authenticator can decrypt that, it now has the real true private key in memory and can then use that private key for cryptographic operations such as WebAuthn. Now, if you happen to have a different YubiKey and it's not the one that actually created those blobs and you try to decrypt them, the blob will fail to decrypt and it will fail its HMAC and the private key will not be accessible, meaning that you cannot continue or forge that. Now, the frequently asked question at this point is, is this somehow less secure because you are exposing these credential IDs when someone prompts for a username? And the answer is no. These are encrypted with the AES-128, they are hmac -ed. So if someone is able to decrypt these, then we have very significant problems in the security of cryptography on the internet as a whole. This style of key, where the key is ephemeral and decrypted out of the internal primary key, is called a non-discoverable or a non-resident key, or internally, a key-wrapped key. Of course, the word non-discoverable here or non-resident key implies the existence of discoverable keys or resident keys. A resident key or a discoverable key is a key that's stored inside the limited storage of the device. And when you request a user from, uh, when you request an authentication from a website where you have this uh, set up, a blank credential ID list will be provided to you. So in the presence of no credential IDs, 
Your authenticator goes, okay, well, I now need to discover which keys could be used here. I haven't been given that list. I need to work it out. It then investigates which set of private keys it has, and it matches up the relying party ID with the private keys it has, and then offers them as cho choices for the user to use. Now, of course, because we are now storing these within the device and we have that storage available, we can embed little bits of metadata, such as the user's unique ID or the user's display name, so that we can present this to the user in an authentication selection dialog. The problem here is that with many models of keys, unfortunately, they support this many credentials. And this is a blank slide because they don't support any. So there are some devices which can't store data. Some devices have very limited storage. They can only store eight resident keys. YubiKeys uh, support generally about 32. Some devices have near infinite storage, such as a laptop or a phone, where the storage of, private, of these private keys and being discoverable or resident is bound by the size of the NVMe drive within that machine. So, this is really cool. The, the key storage you know, uh, can be infinite for some things, which means that we can store those usernames and have that little bit of metadata for making some of our workflows a little bit nicer. But we also have a lot of key storage that is finite. 0 to 32 is the common numbers. And unfortunately, as a relying party, you can't probe for that storage capability before or during that request. You either can request it or you can't. And unfortunately, some devices, such as CTAP2, can never delete or change a key. And this has some very uh, negative impacts on uh, transgender or community members or women uh, because they may not be able to update or change their personal identifying information in these devices without a very, uh, very weird and ex uh, not obvious user workflow that I only learned about yesterday. But of course, the problem is the bigger problem there is, of course, you can't delete a key. So once you fill up your storage, that's it. You, you can't delete a key that you no longer use. So unfortunately, we have to assume right now that we have finite and you know, keys can't be deleted out of storage, which means that we can't really request resident keys at the risk of damaging people's security keys. This leads us, however, to our third definition, which has become more recently popular, and that is that people define pass keys as resident keys. Now, for the reasons I've just described, I don't like this definition because while resident keys have some really fun properties with username autocomplete and discoverability and being able to sit in your keychain and some other things like that, the problem is, is that by requesting them or forcing them outside of just opportunistic existence, we do have potential harms against people and I don't think that's okay. So great, okay, we've now talked about these keys, how they're stored, they're secure, they've got multi-factor, that's great. How can I use these in my website? You know, you're, I, I bet everyone at home right now is just jumping up and down with excitement and itching to go, wanting to use and deploy these. This is my obligatory warning. Writing your own cryptographic code is great fun and is a really wonderful educational experience. If you want to learn the internals of how cryptography or security systems work, Please, write that code. But there is a big gap between writing that code for education and fun to production. Once you jump into production, there are many more risks and threats and issues that you need to consider. And while it is possible to learn these risks and what these considerations are, it is still a big gap. And it is one that you need to be aware of before you want to make that leap. Now, I don't say this lightly. I say this as someone who has probably a problem. This is just a subset of my collection of security keys. I've spent a lot of time with um, uh, this standard and this library and with the co-authors of, of the WebAuthn Rust library working on this uh, on WebAuthn, and there are many gaps in this standard. And I mean, this standard is 164 pages long, and I've probably read all of it. The spec for WebAuthn is trying to solve many use cases. It's trying to solve all of these different problems in one spec. So if you have a, if you have a narrow use case like pass keys or I just want cryptographic auth, 
it can be hard to navigate through this complex spec to find how to make that secure use case exist within these 164 pages. The specification is very prescriptive. If you go, sit down and write your own implementation, you'll probably end up with a pretty good WebAuthn library. But there are those gaps, and we do want to give the best secure experience to our users, so you do need to be careful. Some libraries, as implemented, represent the spec as it is, which means that we need to, as developers and implementers, guide those libraries to make sure that we're aware of those gaps and we fill them over or plug them in. Some libraries are built around use cases and can actually wrap these up and have solved some of these gaps, but of course it can be confusing with multiple pass definitions of what a passkey is to know what they actually mean. So this isn't an exhaustive list of WebAuthn libraries. This is just the few that I was able to find in the last uh, couple of days. Unfortunately, I've been very busy and had a lot of uh, personal things, so I couldn't make a longer list. But for Rust, there is the WebAuthn Rust library, which is a use case driven library and has the passkey definition as all possible authenticators. The Python library is very much a, uh, a very good, well-written implementation and follows the specification very exactly. And of course, that means that we need to, you know, be aware of some of the traps. Like, you know, the examples list are resident key or RK is required, so we need to change that to discouraged. And there's some issues around its user verification handling in certain scenarios, so we need to set user verification required as well to force that secure multi-factor authentication. And the same is true of the Ruby library. If your language wasn't mentioned here, and there is a very good chance it's not, um, the general rules are can you set residency to discouraged or false? We can't force resident keys because of the issues around uh, key, uh, key permanency and, and key deletion that I mentioned before. So we need to be able to set that. Is user verification preferred handled correctly? Now, I didn't go over what the bugs are here, but user verification preferred and discouraged are effectively equivalent unless the library has special security hardening in it. Most libraries, if, if they don't indicate that they have this, and they probably don't, you must set user verification required, else your multi-factor devices are actually single factor. If you have strict security requirements, such, such as uh, regulatory compliance or other things, you will need attestation. Attestation is not, I'm not gonna cover it too much in this, um, but it's basically a certificate of authenticity as to the manufacturer or origin of your device, and it allows you to selectively enforce which models or brands of devices are used in your relying party. And finally, when you're selecting your libraries, don't let FIDO certification be a, a barrier to whether you do or do not select a library. FIDO certification represents conformance to an API, not a representation of security or quality. So to summarize, pass keys are a self-contained multi-factor authenticator. They can't be fished. The biometrics and pins can't be exfiltrated from the device they are contained within. They require physical presence, which helps to defeat malware. Key residency can unfortunately cause problems for our users who wish to choose which authenticators they want to use and bring. Sharp edges in the WebAuthn specification means probably don't go down to Bunnings and believe it's a DIY job. The libraries are still evolving and options that you as an implementer choose to use in those libraries probably need careful review. And you will need to be empowered to assess things yourself and I hope that this talk has done so for you. But finally, passkeys are a secure and easy way for users to authenticate as well as yourself. So your homework uh, after this session is to go and implement passkeys for your own websites from what you have learned today. Now I, this assignment will be due by Next Everything Open, and I will be reviewing each website individually. Uh, and of course, if you would like to submit early, please email me these. My name is uh, William Brown, and you can contact me here. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this. Um, and if I have time, uh, I am going to go through some questions from the talk session yesterday. Do I have time? I need a nod. Hello from the back. Yeah, I've got time, cool. So uh, what's happening right now is just that I am actually having to re-record the talk um, because I created some technical chaos yesterday. So yesterday when we had more audience members in front of me, there were a number of questions that 
were presented by them, and I think they were really good questions, and I want to repeat them so that they are not lost for the recording. One of the questions was, how can I prevent user enumeration? I have a website where if I try to log in with a username and I get the credential ID list back, I know that that user now exists. If I, log in with a user, if I attempt to log in with a username that does not exist, I get an empty credential ID list so I know that that user does not exist. So the individual in question believed that that was a reason to you know, use resident keys. And that is arguably a reason. And user enumeration, it was uh, yesterday while I was answering the question, in my head I said, oh, user enumeration isn't a problem. And then in, within the 60 seconds of answering the question, I realized that it actually was a problem in certain cases, depending on metadata and privacy. So to prevent user enumeration, uh, we, we talked about this later, and uh, what we came up with was that you could actually take the username that was being presented and use that to false, falsely generate cr credential IDs that look legitimate uh, in a stable and repeatable way just to confuse attackers so that they do not know if the credential ID is legitimate or not. Um, so we, I will probably write up a blog post on this and maybe extend WebAuth NRS with this as a feature in the future. Do browsers warn you before you create a resident key? Since I've just sat there and talked about how sometimes resident keys can cause problems for our security keys, do we get a warning before one is created? And the answer is no. Uh, as I understand it, browsers do not warn you before you create a resident key. And unfortunately, without you know, we, we don't really have access to control the Chrome or Safari uh, user interfaces. We need to ask them to change their UIs or change the behavior of how things like resident key preferred handles with security keys um, for this really to become a better user experience. But it's also just one of those problems which it's very hard to communicate what the challenges are with resident keys even within a tech space, let alone external to a tech space. Um, and you know, if giving users a secure and accessible method of authentication is our focus, we need to try and make that as easy as possible. And trying to communicate these complex do you do not create a resident key or not is not really something that's going to help with this. Um, I've already seen some very bad UIs. Um, I have a, a really good neighbor and she's a lovely person, she's an accountant, very intelligent, and you know, obviously outside of tech. And I asked her to you know, test the same websites that I demonstrated with her Android phone, and it came up with, you would like to create a security key. Please enroll your cryptographic security key. Would you like to log in? And she just stepped back and just went, whoa, okay, you know, I, I think I've just been hacked. And it, you know, if we have problems with communicating to people how to enroll their, dev their devices in the first place, we're going to have much bigger challenges with trying to communicate about the risks and positive, the positives and negatives of resident keys, basically, uh, on those devices to help them make informed choices. So this communication is really difficult. A question that was then asked is, <laughs> so what are resident keys good for? If they're problematic, then why are they used at all? And when could I use them? So resident keys do have good, some good properties. So uh, one of the properties that is really good is that... Uh, the way that the synchronized devices work, so say your Apple iCloud or Android, these are all resident keys because of the way that those synchronization mechanisms work. Um, they could, in theory, synchronize an internal shared primary key just the same way that YubiKeys have it built in, but they've chosen to synchronize the resident keys instead. Um, so key residency can prompt for key synchronization on these platforms. So Apple will always create a resident key no matter what you ask for, um, so that it enforces that they are synchronized. Uh, I believe that Android may not actually create a synchronized key in some cases, but we've got to choose. Do we brick devices or do we make it so people just have to enroll their two phones? I don't, you know, what's the more lasting harm versus the, the benefit? Um, there are some other use cases where uh, the, one of the use cases is username auto-completion and the thing is, I do, like, yes, it allows username auto-completion through a thing called conditional UI, where you send the blank credential ID list and the user is prompted, hey, here are the credentials just for this website, which one would you like to use? And yeah, it's a pretty slick UI, but I don't think that justifies, again, the possible harms that can happen from preventing people being able to choose devices they want to use. Um, and the final... Uh, 
option is things like uh, devices that are more offline or disconnected. So one of my home projects is I actually want to make a, a WebAuthn NFC door unlock um, where you hold your key up to the door. And because of the way that these keys work, you would need that to be a resident key for that kind of thing. So resident keys would uh, could be used a lot more in, say, like a corporate environment where you control and issue keys to someone and that can have the resident keys on them. Um, but, you know, there are those, those problems. But with your door unlock, why does it have to be resident? Can't you just send the 3,743,105 different credential IDs that have previously been registered into the device to try and authenticate? The answer is no. Um, there is a limit to how many credential IDs you can provide to a device um, uh, during an authentication request. And if you provide too many, the device will have a little panic attack and not work. So you can't just send it like this huge list of all possible credential IDs and just pick out which one that was used. You have to limit that down to the username of the person and just send it exactly those ones, or you need to use the resident keys as, as mentioned. Are software keys not in TPM or Enclaves a problem? Now, uh, the answer to this one is uh, a little bit more complicated, but I wish that I had sparkly, glittery hands at the moment because the answer is, it depends. Um, at one end of our spectrum, we have software keys, and you know they are still better than a password. They are still not going to be fished. They don't have those breach attacks or replay attack threats that that we have from you know disclosure of passwords or password hashes. So. Just having cryptographic auth in those software keys is already a huge win for user security over you know, passwords and TOTP. But at the complete opposite end of this spectrum, we have strict regulations and compliance for individuals, businesses, high assurance environments. And here we really probably do want keys stored in secure enclaves or hardware, or at least hardware backed in some way. And because of this... Um, uh, entire spectrum, there's a number, of, there's a spectrum of controls that you have, the major one being attestation, which is again that validation and certificate of authenticity of devices. So it really comes, so I'm not really worried about software keys, but there is a spectrum of threat models that you have to consider here. Have you heard about insert favorite or thing here? Uh, no, I probably haven't. When I went and looked up insert person's favorite or thing here, Okay, cool, but it doesn't mean it's widespread or used, um, and, and that's really the problem, is that you know, it's one thing to have your favorite new or thing, it's another thing for it to be widely deployed and embraced and in people's hands. And right now, WebAuthn may not be perfect, but it's in people's hands, and so we should use it. You keep saying attestation, what is that? All right, this is like the third time. So let's actually explain it. It is the official Nintendo seal of quality. What it is is that when you register your key, it is sent, it is signed, along with a certificate that says, this is a signature from the manufacturer's CA signing key that says, yes, this actually is a YubiKey and it is exactly this model and it has exactly these properties. Or you get something like a, a Phaeacian key and it will have the Phaeacian signed one that says, hey, this is a Phaeacian key, it is a Phaeacian E-Pass, it does this, it does this. As a relying party, you can specify which CAs you trust and which individual device models you trust or want to use based on your requirements. This is what attestation is. There are very few WebAuthn libraries that support this, so if you need attestation, you will probably have to do a fair bit of legwork to make it happen. Uh, WebAuthn RS is probably the closest to having a production viable public version of attestation available for you to use. And what this lets you do is you can say, okay, we have tested and asserted that Yubi keys are really good and Nitro keys are really bad, which by the way, they actually are, don't buy Nitro keys. Um, we can assert that only these keys are used when, they, when users register and now we know they have to have at least these security properties. The caveat with attestation is that there are some devices which if you request attestation will not provide a credential at all when they uh, go to register or will not provide an attestation certificate, so you have to reject these. Um, or it could absolutely prevent um, people from 
registering those devices. So you also still need to be careful with this. Can auth vendor product do use case? I have no idea. I'm, I am not the font of all auth vendor product features. So unfortunately, uh, you will probably need to go and check some of this yourself. And I hope that some of the topics of this talk have helped you understand what some of these settings like attestation um, and user verification uh, and key residency actually mean. So once again, thank you for sticking with the, the set of questions that have been asked from yesterday's users. I uh, really appreciate you watching the talk. And again, I really appreciate a uh, big thank you to the AV crew who have given up their lunch break to re-record this talk with me. Uh, thank you very much for their patience as well. And big shout outs to my co-contributor, Michael Farrell, who has been a wonderful support and uh, contributor to the WebAuthn uh, space and, and helping me out a lot with this. So if you have any questions, please email me at william.brown at Thank you.